All right, new week, new set of slides. Let us talk about objects and classes. Are you ready? So to get there, we're going to have to first talk about this concept called structs, which is the C++ kind of version of saying the word data structures. You've heard that term before, data structure. If only I could spell it. So that's what struct is short for. It's short for data structure. It's a way to arrange information. So what does that mean? Uh, well, one way to arrange information is in a type, like an int or a double. But there are plenty of things that we'd like to store in one big chunk uh, that we don't really have the ability to do yet. The only way that we could fix that is to be able to make our own types and fill them with whatever we would like. And that is what a struct gives you. That it lets you do that. So a struct is a data type that you make yourself. Isn't that cool? So, uh, for example, if I want to represent uh, 2D or 3D points, if I'm going to make a game or something or a graphing calculator, I can make a point type and just keep track of uh, an X and a Y and a Z coordinate, for example, inside of my P. Wouldn't that be cool? You can do that with structs. So uh, you get to pick the kinds of stuff that you want to store inside of your custom type. Okay. So for example, maybe you can make a variable called s of your struct type, and inside of it you want to store like an int x, a double y, a bool z, a char p, doesn't matter the inner types, but you want all of that information to be packaged together. That's what you can do with a struct. You can pick all the types, it's a box of boxes, and all the names of these stuff that lives inside of your type, those are called member variables. So it's a variable inside a variable. Isn't that interesting? So we'll get into that. And yeah, what you're doing with a struct is you're building up a data structure. You're organizing data in a certain form with certain names. It doesn't have to be all the same type. That was what an array was for, right? Uh, and then every element inside of your data structure, inside of the type that you're making, has its own name. Okay, so X, Y, Z, all that stuff up here. So yeah, it's really, really cool. and once you make a struct, you get your own special type with that name. Everything of that type that you make looks like this. It has its own little inner member variables. It's all one big thing. You get it all at once. And this might sound vague right now. Don't worry. I'm going to get to an example really quickly. Uh, and yeah, it's essentially you're, you're making something that holds other things. That's what a custom type is. Uh, it's very similar to a vector in that sense because a vector held a bunch of stuff but uh, we were forced to only use one type and we used indices to access pieces of a vector slash an array. Now, instead of all that, we're using names instead and you can have multiple different types stored inside of your data type. All right, so it doesn't have to be all ints, all doubles. So without any further ado, let's actually get something concrete going and talk about a data structure that I will call point. Okay, so let's make a point struct. What it's going to do is it's going to name a type that inside of it it's going to store, let's say, two dimensional points. Okay, it's going to store x and y coordinates. So every time we make something of that type, p, it will be able to hold two things, two, three, we can give it to it like that, uh, and each of those things will be called x and y, and this will represent like the real point, two, three. Yeah, that is what my P will represent. That's how we hold it. And in order to define a type that has an X and a Y member variable that are both maybe doubles, here's how you do it in C++. We're going to make a struct definition, and that's going to make us a brand new type that we can use for ourselves. So we say struct, struct point, that's the name of the type. And then we put some braces. And then we put all the stuff that we want inside of every element of that type. And for reasons, you put a semicolon right here after a closing brace, which is weird. Uh, I can explain during office hours, if you would like, why that semicolon goes there. It is abnormal. Uh, but that will define a type. And then we want an x and a y inside of every point. And they should both be doubles, because you can graph any floating point number on a graph, right? So we'll say double x coordinate. And it's like we're uh, creating variables, right? Double y 
coordinate, but this makes a type and tells us what lives inside of that type. Okay, so um, let me. I think it's time. Let's let's code this up. Let's get this far, and watch it happen. So I'd like to do something like this. Point P equals two three or three point five. 2.7. It doesn't matter because we're going to have it hold doubles and I'm going to make a point type now out here. Struct point. This will define the type. Everything that's inside of a point. Points have two member variables because they're supposed to be 2D points, x and y. They're both doubles double x, double y. And so what this is saying is point is a type that has two member variables inside of it. Every time you make a point, it has an x inside of that point and a y. It's capable of holding those things. Okay, so here's me making point, the point p, that holds 2.7 and 3.5 for the x and y coordinates. And there's no use running this program right now because we haven't done anything with the point. It's just going to run and end. We'll get to that. Okay, but that makes a point. And let's talk about some terminology now. All right, because you can make multiple things of that type. You can make a point P, have it hold things. You can make a point Q, have it hold other things. It's just two separate variables. Each of them are points, which means they each have their own little x's and y's. Isn't that interesting? So. Yeah, here's a lot of terminology, sorry to throw it at you, but uh, this is just stuff we have to use for the rest of these slides. So the struct is the type. The struct is point. I made a struct called point, and that defined the shape of what a point should be. Every time I make a point, it has an x and a y. That's the blueprint for it, okay? That's the blueprint for a point. And if I say point P semicolon, that creates what's called an object, okay? Because it's a special type, we call it an object. P is an object of type point, okay? We just made a point object like that, and it's a local variable. So that creates this, and if you say the line just like this, it makes the x and y undefined, just like any other variable. They're just part of P right now, which it might be weird to think about. Boxes within boxes. Uh, and then we have those x's and y's. Those are called member variables. We talked about that. But another name for them is field. Okay, those are synonyms: field and member variable. So you can uh, you can equivalently say that P has two double fields called x and y, or you can say that P has two member variables that are doubles called x and y. Okay, and this one right here would be another point called Q. And you can make it like this, point Q equals 4.5, 7.89. So you can make as many points as you like. It's a brand new type, just like an int. You can make as many of those as you want. So let's make a point Q. Not a problem. OK, so that's a bunch of points. And now we might want to use those points. It's nice to have the x's and y's packaged together inside of this type, but how do we get out the x? How do we get out the y and actually use them? That brings us to something you already know. It's called the dot operator. On an object, you are allowed to use a dot after its name. So technically, vectors are objects. Strings are objects. We just didn't know that term before. Uh, but we're allowed to use the dot on any object and access its fields, OK? Um, I do want to point out again that p's x and q's x are completely different, right? Completely different places in memory. Same with their y's. Uh, and so if I want p's x, I just say p dot x, OK? That's what you do. If I want q's x, I say q dot x. And that will also let you set things as well. I could say p dot x equals 42 like this. I'll just write it up here again. This line. Go into p, that's what the dot does, and get the member variable x. Set it to 42. And so now p's x holds 42. And you can extract things just as easily, just as easily as you could set them. And you can output p's y, for example. Okay? So uh, 
that's that. So I could have set p this way, right? Uh, let's do it like that. And then I could have said, so it's undefined. And then I could say p dot x equals 2.7 and uh, p dot y equals 3.5. That's an alternate way of initializing a point. There is shorthand for that, which is an array-like syntax. Okay, and so you just give the things in order, like the first thing in the definition was x, then the next thing was y, and so this will set q's x and y in that order. Okay, but you can always do it this way too, using that dot, and then you can print stuff out and be like, uh, see out. Let's make it all pretty. Uh, so I have p dot x, and then maybe a comma space. Ah. And then p dot y, and then a closing parenthesis and an end l. So that's me printing p. Let's make sure that that works. Cool. And so it's getting those elements, p dot x and p dot y, and printing them out. And that was my point. Now we can do the same for q. And that'll print out q's coordinates so that it's saving in its struct inside of the, the q object. Okay? So that is how you get the things that are part of that type. Hopefully that makes enough sense. And so yeah, you can either use the dot to set things or that array-like syntax. Either way works with a, with a struct, all right? So that is the dot operator. You've been using it before, but you didn't really maybe understand what's really happening. Like with a vector, what does it mean to get do a pushback on v? Well, it's like that function belongs to the vector v and only to it. That's the key. Okay, we'll, we'll go down that rabbit hole a bit deeper later. Okay, but structs are essentially uh, a nice way of packaging together a bunch of data. So that also gives us another way to return multiple values from a function, doesn't it? Because we first learned that we could use a bunch of reference parameters like we're doing in our lab right now, just use as many as you need to give back values, or you could return a struct because you can put as many things as you want inside of a type, uh, just return a big package of things at once as that type. That could be another option. Isn't that cool? So uh, with that in mind, let me show you how you can make an add function for points, okay? It'll be able to take two points maybe 2, 2, and 3, 3, and uh, let's define adding points as adding their individual coordinates. So adds the x's, makes 5, and adds the y's, also makes 5. Uh, maybe just for posterity, let's make the, the numbers different so that you can see what's going on there. Let's do 2, 4, and 3, 5, and so now it's uh, 5, 9, yeah? So let's make an add function on points. Let's do that. I want to be able to do something like this. Say uh, point p plus q or something. Maybe I should write it like this. p plus q equals add p and q. Yeah, that's what I like to do. I want to make an add function for points that takes two points and gives back a new point that holds their addition. Isn't that interesting? So you can return x's and y's all at once wrapped inside of a point. So point add point, uh, let's call it a and point b. See that? Here I am making an add function that takes two points and returns back a point. Isn't that awesome? I can do that. So point result not sure what to put in it yet, but results x is a's x plus b's x, right? We're summing together the x's and we're also summing together the y's. And then return that result. So here I am returning a point from a function that is the sum of those individual coordinates. How cool is that? And I can print that out. Yay. And so let's have it run and print. It looks like those points together are that, which looks about right. 
How interesting. I can make functions that take those structs and return those structs too. Not a problem. Uh, just to show you your both uh, your two options, let's also make a negate point function that takes a reference to a point and negates it in place. So it's uh, doing this option to give back a value. It's just modifying an, an existing value. So uh, for example, here is a P, let's say. Or here's my P right now. It's uh, 2.7 and 3.5. I'm going to call the point of this negate uh, point function is this. If I call it on p, remember it's taking it by reference so it's actually able to modify p, what it's going to do is negate both coordinates in place. So it's going to change this p to be negative 2.7 and uh, negative 3.5. Yeah, That's the goal. So it's going to take it by reference. And because we're calling it like this, there's no need for it to return anything. It's just a void function that messes with that first parameter. So let's have that. That's what I would like to do. And then I'll print p back out. And here's how we do it. So uh, it's going to be void, negate point. It takes a point by reference. It doesn't have to be called p. Let's call it, I don't know, we already have q. Let's, let's call it r. That's my point that I'm going to negate. And because I'm taking it by reference, I can just do this. Set it. R is x is whatever it used to be ne negated. Same with y. No need to return anything. Just update the point that you got by reference, because we are getting it by reference in this way. That's all you need to do. And now it is the negated form. So that should do it. And what do you know? P now holds in its x negative 2.7, and its y negative 3.5. All right, so that's negating points. Our custom type with an x and a y in it, we took it by reference, and now we can change things. How cool. So uh, this is a good review of references, and so let me try and make this uh, visible. Let me explain what this code is doing when it runs, uh, just like I explained that ink by reference function that I made in a previous lecture when I first talked about um, call by reference. So let's talk about how negate point is working on the stack. So let's remember what our stack is. Just keeps track of who's calling who. So the first function that's always called in a program is main. The terminal calls it. It's the first thing pushed onto the stack. And now main has some local variables. It has a p and it has a q. So let's make sure to save those inside of main's stack frame. Here's what p looks like and here's what q looks like. They both have inside of them, because they're points, x's and y's. p held, what was it, 2.7, 3.5. And q held uh, 4.5 and 7.89. And then I called um, negate point on p. So let me draw everything that belongs to negate point in green, like I did last time because weird things happen when it's a reference, right? Negate point. And it took a parameter called r that was set to be a reference to the p that we passed along, which means here is r, right? It is that p. It's another name for it. It's an alias. And so that's why I am allowed to change r. Uh, and what that does is it really modifies the original p. So when I call it, it negates r's x and r's y, but that's just p's x and p's y. And that's what I end up with. Okay, That is how negate point works. And then once it's done, it pops itself off the stack, and now we're back in main, ready to print out that point that we updated. Okay, So that is negate point in a nutshell. And uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page, I would like you to try to make a struct now. Okay, Try to write a definition of a line segment struct. It will represent the start and end points of a line, because that's all you need to make a line, right? So here is a coordinate system. And all you need to represent a line segment is to know where it starts and where it ends, right? 
because then you can draw a line just like that and that will represent a line that start and end coordinates okay so see if you can write a definition of a line segment struct and remember here's the pattern here's how you write a struct so try that and then I'll talk about how I might do it all right and remember that the goal is we want to be able to say something like this uh, line segment it's, our, it's its own little type line segment ls and have it hold uh, the start and end of a of a line segment so what is a start and end what are these those are coordinates those are points oh man we can use our previous struct did you find out that did you notice that so here's how I could write it I could say a line segment looks like this it has a point as the start the point that we just made and a point as the end that represents a line segment and so inside of it it has an X and a Y that's what start is and here's what end is boxes within boxes within boxes and it should all make sense this should seem logical yeah so to get at like the starting coordinates X I could say something like start because that'll get me uh, oh sorry to get at the starting coordinate of LS I have to say LS dot start and that will give me the point start and then if I want the X out of that for example I can say dot X after that so two dots totally possible that is a line segment please yell at me if this is not making enough sense this is important to be able to build up types like this okay because we're about to get fancier we have made structs which allow us to build up data structures we can have member variables of any type that we want and as many of them as we want inside of our types but there's more that we could do and that gives us something called classes okay classes are when you have both data like we got them well, like we got from structs so classes are structs in a sense but cooler we're ready for them so this is just like structs everything a class can do a struct can do uh, oh sorry everything a struct can do a class can do that's the right way to say it because classes can do more they also have in addition to the data being associated with the type they also have special operations defined on that type okay and this is interesting it's not functions it's something more than that this is operations on the type on a point for example on a line segment and this is part of the type itself weirdly enough the operations that you can do you define them inside of the type like you can define that a point knows how to be negated it knows how to negate itself kind of that's an operation you can perform on it so let me try and give you the idea of this with some silly examples but you really have already used classes okay you have used classes because vectors are classes strings are classes you have used these operations already let me just bring it all uh, back for us okay so here are some silly examples of real life objects that are doing things because the whole point of classes is to model how something might really work in the real world because as humans we like to think about things as like physical entities that can do things that can act on their own that's where these classes come from and why they're such a powerful concept why they're so popular in programming these days so they kind of model real life things real life operations and uh, the data that they hold okay so let's think of some silly examples of real life objects that do things and think about their operations and also about what kind of data is inside of them so for example here is like a uh, type let's let's make the type PowerPoint that uh, somehow holds the PowerPoint for this lecture okay I might be off by one sorry we're oh we are lecture 14 sweet so that's perfect and uh, this is a type maybe it holds like inside of it the data is like every little slide so like this slide is 
uh, a box inside of the Lecture 14 object. Maybe this previous slide is another box inside of the Lecture 14 object. But there's also operations on PowerPoints, right? Special, special to PowerPoints, like I want to be able to add a slide with a certain name to my PowerPoint, and this is an operation that I can perform on it. And so in addition to data being inside of every PowerPoint object, because it's a fancy thing called a class, it also has an operation that belongs to it. Just Lecture 14 has its own operation called add slide. Isn't that cool? And maybe there are other operations that you can perform. And so you've done this already. You've used pushback, you've used size, things like that. Those are operations on classes. Now you know. Let's make a cat type now, okay? A cat type might have as data, whatever you want to store about your cat, maybe it has a name and an age, and you could make those just normal fields, normal member variables, but you can fill it in like this. But you can also have operations on your cats. Maybe they each know how to meow, and you can call the dot meow uh, operation on it. The dot birthday operation might change the age to be one more. The dot eat operation might uh, like change the size of the cat because he's growing or something. Maybe that will affect another member variable that I don't have listed here. But I hope you get the idea. You can have data and operations, different kinds of things that you can perform on just cats, okay? Same for dogs, like maybe every dog knows how to woof, right? You can have a dot woof operation. I hope you kind of understand where I'm going with this. So data plus operations, that's what these things called classes are, okay? So let's think about this and let's make a class for points instead of a struct. Let's make a fancier thing. Instead of struct point, we're gonna say class point and we're able to define both data and operations. That's the main difference, okay? So let's think of the kinds of things that we want to do to a point, because those could be the operations associated with points rather than just regular functions that are sitting around in weird places, okay? This is a bit nicer because the operations will be bound to the type, okay? I promise that this is a good idea. It will make our lives easier. So we'd like our points to hold not only data, like they were, they were holding x's and y's, they need those definitely, but we also want points to be able to respond to our commands, like please point, negate yourself, please add yourself to some other point, please maybe scale yourself by some double scalar, okay? That's going to make it a bigger point or a negative point or a smaller point, whatever the, the double was, we'll multiply the x and y by it. Okay, so these are some operations that we'd like to have on individual points. So instead of saying negate point P, we could say P, you could yell at it and like command it, hey, go negate yourself. P dot negate. Doesn't need any parameters anymore. It's acting on P. All right. Or P dot add yourself to another point Q, please. Something like that. Or scale a point by some amount. So, uh, if I say p.scale2, here's what would happen. Here's what I'd like to happen, at least, uh, to have happen. So if p used to be, if the x's and y's were 1 and 2, if I scale it by 2, that means I want to multiply 2 into each of the coordinates. And so p, please scale yourself by 2. That makes x2 and y4. Those are some nice operations that I would like to have on my uh, on my points, okay? So, uh, one extra thing in order to get this is you have to say public. And I'm gonna talk about that in just a second, okay? Everything else kind of makes sense. It's everything from a struct, plus you declare all the operations that you want to have on points, just normal declarations, as you would make uh, a declaration of a normal function. These are now declarations of operations on points. The one extra thing is this thing called public, and I promise I will explain that more in just a second. But this is kind of how you would define the class, okay? And I will actually code this up in, uh, I think, two slides. So we'll get there in just a second. There's more terminology first, okay? Let me check my time. Oh, we're doing just fine. So um, here is what I would like to say about this. When you introduce classes, you still have objects, okay? Instead of a struct now, we have class instead of that. 
uh, and we still have member variables, but now we also have member functions. So let's go through all these different ideas. Okay, so class, it's very similar to a struct. Don't worry, it holds stuff, but it also holds uh, more than just a struct stuff, right? It holds operations as well. And so a class defines a type just as good as a uh, as a struct can do, as well as operations on that type. Okay, that's key. In addition to x and y, points also know how to respond to, hey, negate yourself. Hey, add another point to yourself. Hey, uh, scale yourself by some double, something like that. Okay, so that is the new thing. And a class is, just like a struct, the name of a type, right? But an object is a value of that type of some class's type. So point p, if I say this, p, or sorry, point is the class. It's the name of the class because we're going to make point into a class. And then p itself is the object of that uh, point class. OK, you can have as many of those as you want. They're just elements of that type. So that's one thing that's uh, hard to keep in your mind as you're first learning this. I know there's a lot to learn, but we'll get there together. and. Uh, now we have fields and member variables. Those are exactly the same as they were inside of structs. No difference. Those still exist. We still we still draw boxes with boxes inside. We just also have operations. So in addition to fields and member variables, we also have member functions, functions that belong to the type. Okay, We call those member functions, similar to the word member variable. Right. Another name for them that uh, you might have heard me say already is method. Okay, that's what happens when you have an operation defined on a class. So push back on a vector, that's really a method. Size on a string, that's really a method that we've been calling. Okay, so that is the new term, and those are the operations that are defined on the class. Okay, and so uh, classes give us something very powerful that's very, very popular these days called object oriented programming. You might have heard of that. It's a very powerful programming concept. It's a very popular one in industry, shortened to OOP for short. OK, so we with classes can perform or we can make object oriented programs. We can do object oriented programming. And that uh, that flavor of programming just means, OK, we're going to make a bunch of classes and think about all of our types that way. Like instead of using a bunch of normal variables and making functions, we're going to make a bunch of classes and methods that can act on those classes, okay, as much as we possibly can. That allows us to think of these types like real world objects that we can talk to and have do our bidding, okay? And that is the idea of object oriented programming and where it comes from and what it wants, all right? So now we're ready to finally make our point class and here is exactly how you do it. Uh, you say class point and then in between curly braces, again with a semicolon, again I will explain that in office hours if you'd like, but not here, um, you give what you want, okay? One key thing, in addition to the names of the member variables and the methods that you are defining here, because that's their name, methods are uh, member functions, in addition to those you have to say the word public, and let me try and explain what this means. It will become more apparent um, in CSI 41 what public is trying to do, but uh, you'll get a good experience of it in these slides too, because we're also going to talk about something called private. All right, so uh, let's talk about public first. What public does is it gives the user access to everything below. So the user is allowed to get at the x, get at the y, call negate, call add, call scale. And that, that makes perfect sense, right? We want the user to be able to use our things inside of our classes. That's fine. So that's what it does for right now. I will expand on that definition later. So give the user access to everything below that colon, right? All this stuff down here, give the user access to it, OK? So that's what happens. So remember the public. And then what you do is you put the member variables inside just like for struct, so every point should have an x and a y associated with it. So like p and q, for example, uh, those need x's and y's. And then also you put the methods inside the class. These are functions that belong, member functions, 
because they belong to points. Okay, and you can give their implementation as well in there if you'd like. We'll eventually shorten this. We'll give declarations and we'll define them outside, but this is fine for now. Okay, so that's how you do it, and so here's how you can use these things now. So I can make a point P and a point Q with this line, and that will create them, make the space for all their member variables. And they also each know how to respond to those operations. So P's X and Y in this code, we're going to set to one and two, it seems. And Q's X and Q's Y, I don't know. We can just imagine that they are unset right now because they really are. They're question marks. And then we can call P.negate, OK? And the whole point of having a member function, a method, is that this is us yelling at P saying, go negate yourself. It calls the negate method on P, specific to P. It does nothing to Q's X and Y. It knows to go and negate only P's X and Y. That's what a method means. OK, so it'll make it negative 1 and negative 2. That's what this will do. And uh, it just knows, hey, I'm modifying P. It knows what was on the left side of that dot. OK, so um, with that in mind, Let's make this. Let's make the point class and let's let's actually write this code and watch it work. Okay? Let's do it. So um, here we go. Let's code this up right here. I'll make a file called classes.cvp. And so here is me writing the point class. Oh no, um, darn. I'd like to make this as pretty as possible. I don't know why it pasted exactly like it did, but that's okay. And we'll get there. Okay, so I need a negate method, a add method, and we'll take the other point by constant reference, because why not? And then here's how you scale points. Okay, so let's go back and make those objects like we were doing over here. Call p.negate. And then we can also print out a point, let's say. Um, I'll steal that from this code right here, because it'll still work. Yay. OK, so uh, let's just make a p right now. That's fine. Or I think the whole point of me writing Q here is so that there are multiple objects and we know that only P is being talked about here. Only P is being affected here. So maybe I'll keep it around. So here is the kind of operations we would like to do. And now let's implement them. So a class is the same as a struct. But in addition to these data values, we also have operations. OK, so here is how you implement a um, a method. OK, so in here, when we are in here running the body of this method, right? It's not just a function, it's a method. We are allowed to talk about x and y. OK, this is a very important thing right now. When I'm inside of this method, I'm allowed to talk about x and y because I know that this is a method of the point class. Every point object has an x and a y. All right, the x and y are the current objects x and y. What I mean by that is if I say p.negate, when this goes and jumps up here and it calls the method, p is the current object being acted on. That's the x and y we're talking about up here. OK, that's a very important thing to understand when you first learn about this. So when I'm calling negate, there's always the concept of the current object that this method is being called on. And for this code down here, it's p. All right. So how do you negate given an existing x and y? You just reset them, right? x is negative x, whatever it used to be negated. Same with y. And this is going to update that object's x and y. So p's in this example. If I called q.negate, it would be talking about q's x and y. OK, that's what it means. So add is very similar to before. We have a point result and results. X is going to be 
the current objects x, right? So in this case, it's going to be, uh, let's add p to q. So let's set q's x to 3 and q's y to 4. So point p plus q is equal to p add q. This is going to say p, you're my current object, yell at you, call add, call your add method with q as the other thing that I want to add. That'll be going into o. Okay, so the current object is uh, p. Okay, it is the target of this method. I'm calling it on p, p dot, right? So I say result.x equals x plus the others, x, o dot x. This is the current object, so p's x. And then this is q's x right here, because it's going into o. You see that? Did you catch that? That is key. Definitely study this code. And then the y of that result is going to be my current object's y plus o's y. And that is the sum of those two points. So it's always my current object is implicitly there. It's just x and y. And then here's the other thing that was passed along when this method was called. OK? That is important to think about. And then let's do scale for good measure. How do you scale yourself by a given scalar, and we could say q dot scale by 2, or 2.0. What this is supposed to do is scale its x and y by c. x equals x times c, and y equals y times c. Okay? Scale it by that amount. And this is going to act on q now. So when I call it and it goes and jumps up here and runs this code, it's talking about q's x and q's y. It's the current object's member variables. Okay? And so now I can print all these fancy things out, and that'll be that. There's that one, and then there's this one. And just to say to see that p was properly negated, let's print out p up here. All right, and then we're gonna do all those fancy method calls. Are you ready? So let's see if we can understand why it's gonna do what it's gonna do here. Oops, it looks like I forgot something here. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I think uh, scale was supposed to scale the actual object. So I'm going to call it void scale, OK? Unless I was lying to myself. No. If I want it to do this, it has to be void scale. It's going to modify the, the current object. Sorry. That's what it should have been. And so let me change that in both of these places. We don't want to return anything. We just want to modify ourselves. So that should be void. Excuse me there. Uh, and now it should be happy. Yay. So let's see if we can understand what's happening here. So it prints p's x and p's y. Yep, now that was set to 1 and 2. And then we negated p right here. And so p should now be negative 1, negative 2. Cool, that's that one. And then the addition of p and q is, well, q is 3, and remember that p is negative 1. It's x is negative 1. So that makes 2 for the x-coordinate summed. And then the y-coordinate of their addition is negative 2 plus q's y, right? Which is 4 right now. And so that gives me 2 as well. OK? So that's 4 minus 2 and 3 minus 1. So that's 2, 2 as that summed together point, the p plus q. And so that's what I'm printing there. And then finally, we scaled Q right here. And that will make it, instead of 3, 4, it makes it uh, 6, 8, because we scaled it by 2 in each coordinate. So now it's 6, 8. And it's being modified. So here we are doing that modification process, where when we call the method negate or scale, uh, it's modifying the original object. It's taking x, whatever it used to be of that current object, and changing it. Okay? Same for here. Add is different in that we call it with ourselves always and some other point, and then we add those. And we return back something new. We don't change our current object at all. Okay? So that is, in a nutshell, the point class. Okay? We made data associated with a point, and we made operations associated with a point. Isn't that awesome? So this is a very powerful concept called OOP, Object-Oriented Programming. 
And I think the very last thing that I want to show you is let's talk about that idea of it's always your current objects member variables that you're talking about. Okay, I'll make sure we're doing fine on time. Yeah, we're doing perfect. So here is the idea. Inside of p.negate, when I call p.negate, the x that I'm talking about is p's x, and the y that I'm talking about is p's y. Okay, so here's the kind of thing that's going on when I use, uh, when I say main, I made a p and q member variable, or p and q object, sorry, each holding x and y member variables. So I had x and y, x and y, and p was, um, was it one, two, right? And yeah, one, two, three, four, very easy to remember. So that's what everything looked like when I was right here, like I printed out P right before this line got called. So now let's pretend we're calling this line and let me show you what happens. So uh, C++ will jump up to the definition of the negate method because it is a method. So it'll jump up here and start running this code in a very special way, right? Negate is really, it's secretly a function, but it's a very special kind of function. Methods are special kinds of functions. So there's negate, and inside of p's negate, p.negate, because I called it on p, right? p.negate. It jumps up here, and the x and the y are set to, or essentially references to, p's x and p's y. That's what's going on. So all the green things belong to the negate me method call. Whenever you say x, it's talking about p's x. Whenever you say y, it's talking about p's y, because we called it on p, p.negate. That is the main idea here, okay? So that's what happens, and that's why it is going to change them to negative one and negative two, uh, and not mess with q, because I didn't say q.negate, I said p.negate. It's asking p to negate itself, okay? So the key idea for all of this is that it is the current objects member variables. Those are the ones that are visible as those names inside of a method whenever it gets called. So if you're calling p.negate, you're getting p's x, right? And p's y when you call a method on p, because that's what you're doing here when you say the p dot. You can just say x and you're getting that object's x. You can just say y and you're getting that object's y, okay? So there's plenty more to this, but this was your first taste of classes and structs, okay? So hopefully you understand the, the idea of structs, why they're so nice. You can package together data, and then classes are one more than that. It's allowing you to package together data and operations, which makes for a very, very powerful programming paradigm called object-oriented programming. It is very exciting, okay? So uh, you just had a taste of your first class, so definitely go and study this. This is a very important concept. It is also not the easiest one to learn, I'm sure you've noticed during this lecture. So definitely give it some time, study the code that I wrote and I'm posting today, and I will see you back in the next lecture and we will talk about fancier class implementations. Okay, so I'll see you then.